I feel like it's hard for me to measure up. Like, how, how should I come up? What's my entrance? Uh, they should come from the ceiling? I don't know. All right. Hey, welcome. My name is Drake. It's an honor to have you with us today here at City Church. I'm the pastor here. Uh, listen, no matter where you're walking in on your spiritual journey, we're so glad to have you. You're love, safe, and welcome. Our mission here at City Church is to help people find their way to God from where they are, and we do that by practicing the way of Jesus together in Boulder. So really hope that uh, you feel welcome, and we'd love to help you on your spiritual journey wherever you are. Um, as we get into uh, today's celebration and message, I realize we're walking in kind of in all kinds of different spaces on our spiritual journey. So I want to start with a story just to help everybody get on the same page. You guys cool with that? You don't have a choice. So it's, I mean, it's fine, but I figured I'd ask permission first, okay? Um, so uh, my family and I, we like to frequent Sam's Club. Any Sam's Club people in the room? Costco people? Okay. Yeah. The Costco tries bigger, I've noticed, and, and it's like the target of the Walmart. Anyway, all right, well, we ended up at Sam's Club somehow. It's like point two miles closer. So there we are at Sam's Club. And, and we like to frequent Sam's Club uh, for some grocery shopping, mainly because I want to see, this might, you might be, you can judge me all you want, but I kind of want to see how long I can make one grocery trip last. You know what I'm talking, like how long can I stretch it out before I have to go back? So I go to Sam's Club to do our shopping and inevitably I end up with like nine too many onions for the recipe that I needed and like, you know, 15 extra potatoes. You know what I'm talking about? It's a sad day. So if you ever need extra vegetables, come to my house because I bought a whole bag for one meal. But um, there's always, you know, when you walk in, there's always that dude, it's, and it's almost always a guy. I can't think it's, if it's been a lady, but it's always a dude, in my, at least in my experience, trying to sell you some kind of like cell phone data plan package. As, you know what I'm talking about? Do they do that at Costco or is that just a Sam's Club thing? The lower end of, okay, cool. So there's always that guy or lady, try, and listen, if that's you, the story's about you, I'm so sorry. Your job is hard, but this is, this is just real life, okay? You probably already know this is true about your job if you already do that. But you walk in, and, and uh, typically around this time, they're standing there awkwardly. And, you know, uh, at Easter time, they might even have like a little bowl of Easter candy that you can get two aisles over. But, but there it is, open in front of you. And that's really a trick to get your kids to walk like five steps too close in that direction. And then you're obligated to like make eye contact and have a conversation. And you know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever? Okay, so, so there's always that awkward moment of passing by, and, and then my kids definitely drift in that direction when there's a bowl of candy, and, and there's this weird thing going on where he's looking to pitch you a deal on something that you're already carrying in your pocket. You know what I'm talking about? Like 21st century, here we are, and he's like, oh, here's the next best thing, a data plan, new phone bundle, and you're like, I... I'm good, man. I, I, I've already got it. It's like something that you don't need. And even if you did, let's just say you were in a position where you did need a step in that direction, that would be the last place and the last means by which you would go about acquiring those necessities. Are you guys tracking with me? It's just such a, such a weird, awkward scenario. And I think for some people, that's how Easter feels. Are you guys tracking with me? Nobody? Oh, no, okay, or are you just going to pretend like it's not? That's fine. Some of you, here's just my, this is my personal perception, okay? I didn't grow up in church, so this is definitely me before I met Jesus. But for some people, I, I think it's, you end up at a gathering like this, and it's like, man, listen, dude, I, I don't care how nice of a guy you are, how down to earth and not crazy you seem from the outside. Like, I don't care how cool your tattoos are or how good your cold brew is or how cool these orange pews and orange carpet are. I don't care how life-changing those cookies are in the lobby, let's just cut to the chase. We know why you're here. You're here to talk to me about this first century Jewish rabbi, peasant guy who died on a cross and supposedly rose from the grave, and somehow that event in history is supposed to have some necessary bearing on my life, right? I mean, that's why we're here. We know you're the dude standing there at the cell phone counter trying to sell me a new data plan phone bundle, and you know what? I, I, I'm good. I've got what I need. 
and, and I, again, I'm not saying that, that that's a hateful posture. I just think like, you know, there's a smile and nod and thanks so much, but that is, that's about as helpful as what they're offering me at Sam's Club as I walk by to get my groceries. So can I offer a different perspective and picture today, no matter where you're walking in on your spiritual journey? Are you guys cool with that? All right, very good. So, so relax. Listen, I don't need your credit card number. I'm not trying to sell you a data plan. I mean, if you want to give it, you, I'm just, it's a joke. It's, it's a joke. I don't need your credit card number. But listen, I actually do believe that the most important event in human history is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's the most decisive and important event that has ever happened in human history. And it's not because some cheap sales pitch that that landed in my lap that was just too good to pass by or I was manipulated into it or any of that stuff. It's because that event in history slammed directly into the storyline story of my life at 15 years old. And it changed everything for me. At 15 years old, something came alive in me that has not ever been able to go back to sleep. And that's why I'm here today. And I just want to acknowledge that we're here for different reasons, and that's okay. And so some of you, you're like, man, I'm here because this service is connected to, you know, friends or family and an egg hunt and, and like a, a mediocre lunch to follow. And that's why we're here, and that's great. Some of you are like, no, no, the lunch is excellent, okay? It's not mediocre, some of you are here to check a box of tradition and move on with the rest of life. Not, not that it doesn't have any value, but it's just like kind of a, a thing that you do moving through the motion. motion. Some of you are here because while you, you might be massively skeptical, there's also something on the inside of you that would love for even a glimmer of hope. I mean, I mean just a glimmer of truth connected to this whole Jesus thing to actually be true. Some of you are somewhere in the middle of all of that. Some of you are like, man, I just barely woke up and got here, and I'm still waiting for the co coffee to kick in, so I haven't considered any of those options. That's fine, too. And some of you, the res res resurrection of Jesus has actually intersected your life, slammed into your life, if you will, in such a way that it changed everything for you as well. And to all of you, happy Easter! Let's go! I'm so glad you're here. And listen, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, I hope you're here. You are genuinely loved, safe, and welcome, and we are genuinely glad that you're here. So I want to take you back to the very first Easter weekend. And uh, Easter is one of those unique things. Uh, uh, my job as, you know, like a, a pastor, I get to communicate often and teach the scriptures. It's great. I love it a lot. Easter and Christmas are kind of like routine stories. You know, it's, it's hard to kind of get out of the bag and come up with something new and fantastic, the same story. But it's a pretty good story. Like, you know, you watch Lord of the Rings for the fifth time and you're like, it's still so good. Or maybe not a Lord of the Rings person. Star Wars, anybody? Costco, Sam's Club. I know, I get it. Whatever your thing is, right? Sometimes you're like, you just keep coming back to it because the story is so good. So the good news is, in some ways, my job is pretty easy because it's the same story every year. And in other ways, my job is a little more complicated because I'm trying not to put you to sleep with the same story every year. So here we go. I want to take you back to the very first Easter weekend. And, and listen, depending on where you are, what you've heard, what you haven't heard, I, I want to kind of bring everybody up to speed. It might not be what you think. It didn't look anything like we are celebrating today. In fact, what you find the very first Easter weekend as the events of the weekend played out is there's this Jesus guy, this disruptive rabbi from the middle of nowhere who has been crucified by the Roman, Roman government. And now there are a tons of disillusioned followers. You have corrupt religious leaders. You have a heart Roman government, and you have no hope nowhere to be seen. You had a broken-hearted mom. There's no savior. There's no son of God. There's no believers. There's no church. There's no hope. It is a dark weekend of the very first Easter because when Jesus died, hope died with him. Everyone had put all of their stock in who Jesus claimed to be, what he said he came to do, and now he's hanging on a cross, and he's buried, and everything they thought they knew about Jesus clearly was not true. There were no Christians, there was no church, there's no Bible, and Jesus was clearly not who he claimed to be, and everyone who was following him was clearly wrong. You see, when Jesus died, everyone expected Jesus to do what dead people do. And that's stay dead. No surprise. And, right? You need it. No one was outside of the tomb on Sunday morning counting down from 10 like, oh guys, here it goes, can't wait for the video to drop, baseline's gonna hit. No, people are hiding for their lives, trying to figure out what's happened. And pretend with me for a moment that that's all that you knew. Some troublesome rabbi who claimed to be God was crucified. He's later, fast forward a couple hundred years, considered to be God by the very Roman Empire, by the very empire that killed him. So fast forward and all of a sudden, 
all of the claims about him are now believed by an entire empire. And now, today, there's hundreds of millions of people all around the world gathering on a day like, like today to worship that very rabbi. And, and just take all of the historical data, which, by the way, all of that is historically indisputable. You, you don't have to argue about the historical timelines and whether these are claims that are true. So the question is, what happened? That, that, that's really why we're here. Like, what happened that would go from that first e Easter weekend and the disillusionment of events to what we are here to celebrate today? Because something clearly happened, right? That, that's where we are. And the answer is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's why we're here. C.S. Lewis says it really brilliantly. I like how he says it. He says it this way. He says, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. It's not just another holiday. And so, uh, again, uh, the Apostle Paul would say it a different way. He says, man, if Jesus didn't really raise from the dead, then everything we're doing is a complete and utter waste of time. Let's go to lunch or brunch or whichever, whatever your Costco, Walmart, whatever, you know, what's your thing? But that's the space that we're in. You see, as followers of Jesus, we don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus because the Bible tells us so or because grandma tells us so or because the church says so or because some professional Christian says so. In fact, you might not know this, but, but without the resurrection of Jesus, we wouldn't have a Bible. There would be no church. There would be no followers of Jesus. In fact, all of those things exist because of this one event in history. And so the good news today is that, that we don't put stock in like an I hope so kind of hope, like just really gritting our teeth, crossing our fingers, leaning in, hoping there's something on the other side. It's way better than that. And so for you and I today, I just want to bring you up to speed. We know of the resurrection because, not because the Bible says or I say or any of that, because of eyewitness accounts around the life of Jesus. And so it's really quite cool that we don't have to just lean into I hope so kind of a hope, but we can lean into historical narrative. In fact, that we have guys like Matthew who, who give us eyewitness accounts. He was there. He saw the events play out. He believed, unbelieved, re-believed, decided to follow Jesus again after total disillusionment. There's that guy. You've got Mark, who got all of his information from Peter, who was an eyewitness account, one of the closest dudes, denied Jesus three times, even used some curse words to prove that he wasn't a follower of Jesus. He's like, I'm not in that club. And then he re-believes and follows Jesus. And then you have Luke, Dr. Luke, who did a thorough investigation of the entire events surrounding the life of Jesus and put together a collection of all of those things for you and I to have confidence. We have John, who was there, who was a little cocky at times, thought highly of himself. But other than that, he gives us some real eyewitness events of what happened with the life of Jesus. We have Peter, who I just mentioned, uh, again, where Mark got his information, who was there. We have James, the brother of Jesus. My brother's in the room somewhere. And listen, there he is, yeah. And you can ask him, listen, I'm a pretty good, I'm a good guy, okay? I mean, impressive on a good day. Don't talk to my wife, though, okay? She can, but outside of that, most people are like, man, that guy's a pretty good guy. I want you to imagine what it would take to convince your brother that you were God. And not just like, like Zeus, God, zaps of lightning bolts, kind of like, out. no, 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 a personal God who loves you and has a desire to redeem you, a God that you would call your king and your Lord. Well, I can tell you it hasn't happened for my brother and I, that's for sure. And, and what I want you to imagine, I mean, it's just kind of crazy. James and his entire family, all of Jesus' relatives, they thought he was crazy. In fact, in one meeting, they tried to come into a meeting and pull him out because they're like, dude, this guy is talking nonsense. And then he dies, and they're like, I mean, <laughs> you said some weird stuff, dog. Like, that's what happened. And, and then they go from totally unbelieving to James calling Jesus his Lord and his King and his savior. And you're like, what happened? What would it take? So much so that James would die for his faith in his brother, be martyred for his faith. And then we have this guy named Paul who is, is a really cool character because he actually is massively against the early church. He's trying to shut down the early Jesus movement. He's being a part of murdering Christians and, and actively, aggressively against all that Jesus represented post-resurrection. And then he encounters the living Jesus resurrected from the dead. And he goes from uh, this, this Saul of Tarsus. He, has, he gets a whole name change. You ever had like an event happen in your life where you just need a new name? 
Like so much as, that's what happened with this diet. He's just a totally different dude. And he becomes the author of a third of our New Testament scripture. So he goes from trying to shut down the church to planting hundreds of churches. And a third of our New Testament is written by that guy. That's pretty cool. You got to ask the question, what happened? How do all of those events begin to reconcile themselves? So I want to bring you to one of many of the accounts of the story of Jesus in John chapter 20 this morning. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. By the way, this is written by John, okay? So this is John's narrative, and he gives himself the title, oh, by the way, the one who Jesus loved. All right, that's, that's a pretty, all right, man, like, that's fine. So, so Peter and the one who Jesus loved came to both and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. I want you to understand that the very first encounters with an empty tomb were not like, hallelujah, drop the beat, let's go. It was someone stole the body. That, that there was no reconciliation of some of the crazy things that Jesus had said about himself and then that being a reality in front of them. Even though he had claimed, I'm going to die and rise again to save the world from their sins and set them free, Everyone's like, someone stole the body. And and what's interesting is in this moment, Luke records for us that that the response is not like, oh, have more faith, Mary. (laughs) Come on, man. No, here's what Luke tells us as they receive this news. All the men in the room, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense, which all the women in the room were like, "Mm mm-hmm. And they were wrong. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but this is the moment. Nonsense. They're like, listen, yeah, you, you must have gone to the wrong tomb. <laughs> you must have got mixed up. Oh, there's no way. That stone is huge. There were guards there. You must be confused. And then John gives us the rest of the story. Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. I like that language, started. They didn't run. They're like, oh, yeah, listen, you guys hang tight. We're just going to go check things out. And they start for the tomb, but then in verse 4, John says, both were running. <laughs> so they get out of sight of the ladies, and now they're taking off. Like, it's a race. And uh, the other disciple outran Peter, just in case you were wondering. John includes that in case <laughs> it's important. It's how, listen, that's how you know some of this stuff isn't made up, right? You, like, you wouldn't include, if you're trying to, like, really polish it and make it look good, you don't include stuff like, oh, by the way, I beat him there. <laughs> but both were running. The other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, he outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. And then Simon Peter came along huffing and puffing behind him, just in case you're wondering where he was. And he went straight into the tomb, which is kind of cool. We see the personalities. John gets there and he's like checking it out from the outside like, I don't know. And then Peter just walks right in. He's like, let's see what's up here. And he goes on. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, all all proper uh, um, burial uh, linens. And, And the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And so we see like this orderly moment. It's not like there's been a mad dash and someone robbed the tomb and there's stuff thrown everywhere. We see the the items wrapped around Jesus' body like folded nicely, like something intentionally has happened here. And then finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, in case you forgot, okay, don't forget this important point. He went inside also, and he saw and believed. I love that John's account is like, oh yeah, I believed. (laughs) Aha. And, And what's interesting is Luke gives us the same account, and Luke tells us that Peter walked away wondering what had happened. So John's like, no, I believe, I got it the first time, guys, don't you worry. But Peter walked away wondering what had happened. So still, even after all of this, after after the moment of his closest best friends coming back, unbelieving, and now, now starting to examine the events, the first assumption from Peter is still not he's alive from the dead. It's this moment of what is going on? And as we look at all of these moments, we see you can read the scripture stories for yourself. The Bibles, by the way, and the seat backs in front of you are our gift to you. You're more than welcome to them. And as you read the scripture stories for yourself, what you'll see is that Jesus then appears to them multiple times alive in person, up to 500 eyewitnesses at one time. And so this is an incredible moment following the resurrection where Jesus is showing up in flesh to everyone, very much alive. And it's in this moment, Jesus' resurrection from the dead, that they begin to re-engage. 
And so I don't want you to think it's not, it's not this fairy tale. It's not like all rainbows and butterflies. In fact, they write themselves into the story as not the heroes, but actually as totally unbelieving. And then later something happens that changes everything, that everyone who had unbelieved and, and is now re-engaging is beginning to re-believe. And I don't want you to, to miss, it's not because of what they believed. It's not because of even what they were taught. Something happened, and it's all connected to what they saw. You guys tracking with me? Okay, that's why this is so important. See, the resurrection of Jesus is not a Bible story. It is the story. It is the hinge point in the human narrative. And so we've had, we have to ask the question, like, how did Jesus, his teachings, his church, his movement survive the first century? And it's all connected to this event and this moment in time, the resurrection of Jesus. And the good news is it also begins to resolve some personal questions for you and me. Like, like what does this mean? What does it mean for me? And so that same John that we just read his narrative, he also captured these words from Jesus in John 3.16. It's one of the most famous verses known very well, uh, even for people who are not followers of Jesus. It's one of the most famous verses on the planet. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, trusts in him, puts the weight of confidence behind his claims and his person. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And that word perish can be translated, shall not be lost to God, as in there's this disconnect and it is able to be brought back together. And it doesn't stop there because then John clarifies for us. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, despite what you might have heard, despite what you might have experienced from followers of Jesus, despite what the news headlines maybe have told you from time to time. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You see, we have a reason to lean in, a reason to believe, a reason to trust, a reason to follow, and it all hinges on this event. And the good news today, friends, is this, that God has done something for you because God is for you. And the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the evidence and the confidence of that. And so the invitation for all of humanity from this moment forward has been to receive, to respond to this good news, to let this reality slam up against the life that you are living and allow it to actually take hold, to face and embrace this reality that God loves us. He loves you that Jesus died for us, that he died for you, that he rose again to prove that he was who he said he was and he can do in your life what he said he would do. And all of his claims, all the crazy stuff that Jesus said, that he could forgive sin, that he could make us new, that he could bring us back into right relationship with God, ourselves and others, that he could give us new life and eternal life, life, hope now and forever. All of that can be worked backward, that if, if the resurrection of Jesus is true, then the claims of Jesus can be leaned into as well. That we can work backwards from that moment in our trust in Jesus. We can resolve some of the challenging things, some of the things that are maybe a little harder to swallow with this one event, that if it is indeed true, it changes everything for everyone. So the invitation from Jesus is to respond to this good news. And it's not like simply to believe. And, and that, that word is kind of tricky because we, we, we get it mixed up with like the fairy tale edition of the lives that we live in Disney Plus. And so we gotta, we gotta really work on that. It's not just an invitation to rearrange the mental furniture of your mind and uh, you know, kind of align your thoughts with a certain way of believing and then check a box and cool beans, you're good to go. It, it's, it's not limit, it, it can include that, but it's way bigger than that. It's massively incomplete. It's not to believe harder. It's not to behave better. You see, Jesus would use two words to invite people to respond to this good news, punctuated by his death, burial, and resurrection. And those two words were to repent and believe. You guys heard those before? Well, you've heard believe like 15 times already, so you're good on that one. But like this word repent, which sometimes we have an allergic reaction to, like, ooh, repent. It's like Mufasa, right? You got to be careful with that word. What does it mean to repent? You see, if you come from a place where you, where you hear the word sin or repent and, and you have this allergic reaction, I, I want to help clarify. You see, Jesus indeed died to save us from the consequences of sin. And if you don't like that word, you can use the word brokenness 
whatever you like. See, the brokenness that, that we see inside of us, outside of us, all around us, like it's, it's not that hard to argue. Like Even if you think you're a pretty good person, there's some dysfunction in the world around you. Would you agree? It's e way easier to throw rocks out there than it is on the inside. But like at the end of the day, you're like, man, there's some, something has gone wrong. Like something has gone horribly wrong in the world. And I'm talking like in the, in the minuscule ways, like just some of the weird dysfunction that happens inside of us and our thoughts and our behaviors and our relationships. And in like the huge ways, like poverty and war and, and, and just the crazy events of the world around us. I met a lady uh, yesterday, her name was Lena, and she's from the Ukraine. And she's not here because life is all rainbows. She's here to, to rescue her family. And, and I look at the events of the world around us, you're like, man, something has gone wrong with the world around us. And, and maybe if you're honest, you would agree, man, there's at least something wrong on the inside at times. And I don't think you have to agree, or you don't have to look very long to agree with that idea. But, but maybe, I, I just want to help you understand today, maybe that when we talk about sin, when we talk about brokenness from the scriptures, maybe it's less of a moral judgment, which is what a lot of, like, don't do those things, do these things, rights and wrongs, rules and regulations. Maybe it's less about a moral judgment, and may, maybe it's just more of an honest diagnosis of something deeply wrong with the human condition. And you see, the good news of Jesus is that with his death and resurrection, it means forgiveness is available. At least that's what he claimed to offer. You see, friends, the worth that God created you to carry, with forgiveness, the invitation is that he can restore that back to you freely. Here's the catch. Without you needing to prove yourself worthy of it. You see, the resurrection is about God being loving enough, not you and I being good enough. The most important discovery that you will ever make, Pete Gregg says, is the love the Father has for you. And the biggest fight of your life will be to actually believe that that is true. That is the good news. And so I think the best way that I know how to wrap up today's invitation is with the words of John Mark Homer. I think he beautifully captures what we're talking about. He says, to repent and believe is to rethink everything you think you know about who God is, who you are, and what the good life you crave actually is. And to put your trust, your confidence in Jesus to heal you, save you, free you, and lead you into the life that you ache for. This, friends, is the invitation of Jesus. This is the confidence we have from the resurrection, an event that changed everything for everyone. And that's the invitation for you today. So I'm going to invite the band to come, and we're going to respond and worship. And there's a couple different ways that you can respond today. Um, but as we, as we take a moment here, I just want to invite you to reflect. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me. You can just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. Um, this is just a moment of privacy. It's not like a super spiritual moment necessarily. It's just a moment for you to like kind of remove distraction from around you, not worry about what anybody else thinks in the room or what they're doing, but just to close our eyes and take a moment to reflect on this good news and what it means for you and what it means for me. struggle to believe that God is that good, that he's that big, that he's that loving, and that Jesus can truly do in our lives what he said he would do. For some of us, we, we, we come up against a story like this trying to see how it fits into our narrative like walking past the guy at Sam's Club. We've already got a phone in our pocket and we don't need what you have to offer. And maybe in this moment, there's this wrestling of, does Jesus have anything that I actually need? Is this good news for me? And maybe in the past, it, it's always been no. Maybe in the past, this is falling. You say, you know what, I'm good. Thanks for the offer. 
but maybe God is doing something uniquely different in your life in this season, and maybe for the first time this good news is, is beginning to set in your heart and mind in a way that it never has before. Jesus had this bad habit of walking into rooms uninvited after his resurrection. And I think for some of us today, maybe Jesus is walking into the room of your heart and mind for the first time, and there's something coming alive on the inside that wasn't there before. And that's God's goodness and his love becoming present to you. And the invitation is the same, repent and believe. Others of us, you're on the outside looking in and you're like, man, I don't know where I land with this and it would be awesome if it was true, but there's so many questions that I have. There's so much to reconcile and I would just say to you, listen, God is big enough and loving enough and totally content to be present with you as you walk through all of that to help you in the process of discovering who he really is, who he really made you to be, and his love for you. And maybe there's some of us in the room where we have uh, been around church, been around community, maybe you grew up in it, around it, maybe you've walked away from it, or maybe you intentionally stayed away from it, or maybe you've got some baggage that you've carried through some really, really negative experiences. I just want you to know, man, we're so sorry for anything that has been damaging to the good news of Jesus. And we're not a perfect church by any means, but we are following a perfect God. And so we invite you simply to consider that what it might mean to be a part of healthy community alongside following Jesus. You're more than welcome here. And so with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, as we reflect, I would just invite you to listen to what God might be speaking to you right now. and then to respond in that space with boldness. My one encouragement for my friends in the room who are not yet followers of Jesus, I would simply encourage you to not wait another day. If your heart is leaning in and this good news is something that is stirring in your heart and mind, I would simply say he's good. He, he, he's too good to resist any longer. To receive the gift of new life and find life in him today. So God, we invite you to use our time of response. The songs that we sing, let them serve as prayers for us as maybe we fumble to have the right words to say. That as we take communion, let it be a moment where we reflect on your death and your burial in our place for our sins, and that you rose again, showing you have the power over sin, death, and the enemy in order to give us new life. Let it fill us with joy and gratitude. For those of us that are followers of Jesus, would it, would it ignite in us a renewal of gratitude and love that we receive once again who you say that we are, who you made us to be, and then we live like that in the world around us. We share that good news with those around us. And so God, lead us in this time. And give my friends conference for those who are, who are leaning in, maybe in this very moment, saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be saved. I want to be set free. I want to step into this new life. And would they have confidence today that as they make that decision volitionally in their head and their heart, that heaven is rejoicing over that moment. And we long to do the same with them. So that would they not keep it to themselves, but would they have the boldness to let us know? about that step towards you so we can walk alongside them. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.